moments later. A few weeks ago, I saw a Rolas channel for the first time, specifically where, as he put it, he tried simulating the entire ocean. I've only dug around in shaders a little bit in the process of making my game, World Turtles, but I find them fascinating. If a large body of water could be made to look like in this thumbnail with a decent frame rate, I wanted to find out more about it. So I watched the video. Without going into too much detail, he simulates over 4 million sine waves with different amplitudes and frequencies, layered on top of each other to provide both large swells and minute surface details, without discernible tiling. All of this runs at a staggering 150 frames per second. In a previous video, he simulated water using up to 650 sine waves before the frame rate dropped to below 60 frames per second. So, something drastically faster was required for large bodies of water with great detail. Enter the legendary Fourier Transform, one of the most useful and beautiful things known to man. If you haven't seen 3 Blue 1 Brown's video on it yet, do yourself a favour and watch it, it's a true piece of art. After applying the fast Fourier Transform and adding surface foam, a roller ends up with a really impressive ocean simulation. And that was it for that video. However, something I always try to do when working through a tutorial is to think about ways to adjust or adapt the situation to do something extra, something useful and hopefully even slightly as cool as the original tutorial. If you're a game developer, I highly recommend this approach. If you can dig into the workings and successfully alter them without the whole thing falling apart, you'll have learned a great deal more than simply sitting through it or copying it as is. The Unity project is available through the link on the Acerola video if you'd like to play around with it. I kept thinking about this video on and off for a few days. I had one clear question for myself. This is a great looking ocean, but how would we handle interactions with a shore or anything else breaking the water surface? Simply sticking an island into it would not cut it. It's clear that the water is totally unaware of this huge piece of rock in its path. I had an initial idea that required sending terrain data to the shader, and after running it through in my head and peeking at the existing shader code, it seemed viable. I did not want to break the water surface up into small parts with different parameters, each with their own wave simulation, leading to different looking waves, since I felt it would be impossible to try and seam these chunks back together. So I thought of a way to allow me to adjust the impact of the one overall set of simulated sine waves differently at different locations on the water surface. If we divide our water surface into a grid, we have evenly spaced points for which we can set parameters for altering the wave simulation locally. Let's take displacement as an example. If we want calmer zones, we need to limit the displacement caused by the wave simulation in those zones. For example, we can have a calm zone for an island by having a circle inside the square with gradually decreasing wave amplitudes. The large waves should then gradually decrease until the water is quite calm and flat. But how do we tell our ocean shader exactly where these adjustments should be and how large they should be? Well, we can send a texture to the GPU, either to this specific shader or to the global shader data, which is then available to all shaders. The first method is quite straightforward, so I'll explain the second option here, since we may want our terrain data to be available to various different shaders eventually. So we need to transform our terrain data into a texture. If we want to create a 100x100 100 100 grid of squares, we need 101 by 101 lines on the grid. So we create a square texture of size n plus 1 pixels. We'll need an array of color 32 to populate the texture with. I've also tested it for an array of color instead of color 32. Since color stores 4 floats with values from 0 to 1, rather than 4 bytes with values from 0 to 255, color uses 4 times as much memory and runs slower, but it doesn't really make a difference on the small 10,000 pixel texture we're working with here. We'll also use a float array for preparing the displacement data. The reason for this will become clear soon, especially for more complicated configurations. The displacement values themselves can be procedurally generated in various ways. Here I've applied the formula for the radius of a circle, centered on the center point of the texture. As we move outwards, the displacement gets more as the radius increases, 
The final step is scaling our adjustments so that they fall exactly from 0 to 255 in order to correspond to the byte values of the color 32 array. Then we slot our displacement values into the texture using the red channel of the color. We can later use the blue, green and alpha channels for other kinds of information. Slotting our island into that karma zone makes more sense than the original situation. At this time you may be thinking, but you haven't mentioned how the shader itself uses this terrain data yet. Also, if the terrain data is on a grid of points, how does the adjustment change so smoothly from minimum adjustment to maximum adjustment across the entire ocean? Wouldn't we expect to see the grid lines? To answer these questions, let's move over to the shader code. Each vertex that the shader uses to render the ocean has a displacement applied to it, calculated from the four differently sized tiled wave simulations. We want to scale that displacement with our terrain data which is presented as a grid of values in the red channel of the texture sent to the GPU. Ignoring the height coordinate, each vertex lies somewhere on this terrain grid. The UV coordinates of the vertex gives us the relative position of the vertex on the ocean square from 0 to 1. We want to find the corresponding relative position on the terrain grid. The desolation that the shader applies breaks the water surface up into hundreds of thousands to millions of triangles, so the amount of detail in the water surface is loads more than the detail in our small terrain data texture. It's almost as if one is continuous for all practical purposes, while the other one is discrete. We can find the four points on the grid between which the vertex lies by changing the continuous position into the discrete one. In order to do this, we need to know the relative width and height that each pixel in the terrain grid texture represents. We'll call it the texel, and its relative size is simply 1 divided by the number of squares the area is divided into, which we call n. We can also send this to the global shader variables. Applying this for x and y, which technically is x and z in Unity, we find the relative position of the pixel corresponding to the bottom left corner of the square the vertex falls in. We can sample this point from the terrain data texture to get the color 32 at that point, and we use the red channel to scale the displacement. Now, if we only use this point as the adjustment, we have a decent adjustment going, giving us a karma circle at the center of the ocean. But when you look closer, you can see the grid lines in the water. Here's an exaggerated example. Visualizing the adjustment applied makes it even clearer. This is because all the vertices in one terrain grid square is adjusted by the same factor, causing discrete jumps at the edges. If we go one texel upwards and one texel to the side of the bottom left pixel, we can sample the other three points of the square within which the vertex lies. We can now apply a bilinear interpolation between the four points and use this as the adjustment factor which turns our discrete case into a better approximation of a continuous case. Bilinear interpolation gives more weight to the corner points closest to the interpolation point, in two dimensions. And if we now look at the water and the visualization of the adjustment factors, the grid lines are gone, and everything is applied seamlessly. Actually, I'm lying a bit. At this point, we have not adjusted the foam in a way, so the water would look like this. The waves are still just as calm as the center, but the turbulent foam plays tricks on your brain making it more difficult to see. However, we can very easily add an adjustment to the foam strength in much the same way, diminishing the foam strength in accordance with the displacement adjustment. We use the green channel of the texture for this purpose, and the interpolation we've already done also takes care of the green channel in one go. Then, where the foam displacement is calculated in the shader, we simply scale it by our factors as before, with some tweaking to make it look right. Ok, so this works well for procedurally generated zones based on functions, but what about random terrain? How do we handle creating the adjustment factors such that it can work on variable terrain? One quick way I could think of was to fire rays down from above onto the terrain and determine the height of the terrain on the grid points corresponding to our terrain data texture. We know the average water level, so we know when the terrain is above or below water. The deeper it is below water, the stronger we make the displacement and the larger the waves become. When the terrain is close to or above water level, we diminish the displacement. You can also play around with the rates at which the factors change to tweak the look. And as a final touch, while we generally reduce the foam the shallower the water becomes, we increase it drastically in very shallow water, which will be the water immediately next to the islands. 
This gives us flatter water but with lots of foam activity, simulating the small breaking waves. We can clearly see this in the difference between the visualization of the displacement and foam factors. So far, I've only divided the terrain into 100 by 100 blocks. You could of course increase the resolution to have more detailed control. Here you can see me cycling through a different configuration every single frame. This means updating the displacement and foam adjustment factors, creating the texture and sending it through to the GPU on every new frame. So this could very easily be changed dynamically in real time, especially if preparing the factors is run on a separate thread. I have also added the functionality of transparency to the water and you could easily cut out parts of the water completely. Finally, you could also do things like changing the absolute height for parts of the water. But the connections between lower and higher planes of water isn't realistic, especially where the direction of flow is up the slope. I don't know whether it would be possible to change the speed of sideways displacement locally only, or even have different flow directions in some areas. That sounds a lot more complicated and would possibly have to be incorporated into the wave simulation itself. It would also be great to have some splashing water, but I'll call it a day for now. I hope you found this interesting and hopefully I can dig around a bit more someday. Please leave any ideas you have to further expand on this in the comments. I'd love to try them out. Goodbye.